Good evening, everyone. Uh, just want to say I got you set up here. Uh, see if they're going to work or not. Uh, there was only one uh, little problem with what the gentleman said earlier. Uh, the funding that comes from this event tonight is actually going to go in my pocket because I have to go back to Europe. And I've got meetings with governments over there that might be a bit more friendly. So I'm going to need some extra funding to, to make the trips and things. So that's where the money will be going. But I do completely, uh, I do completely support the Phoenix Tears Foundation. They're they are doing great work. <coughs> the sound sounds a little bit off. Wait a second here. A little bit of echo. Okay, a little bit better. All right. Well, I guess we all know why we're here. You know, to talk about the greatest medication on this planet that our governments won't allow us to have, which is truly insane. You know, I mean, when you, when you look at the reasoning behind this, there's not a lick of sense involved. You know, this is man's oldest known, safest medication. It's been known to, you know, it's been a known fact for thousands of years that this is the most medicinal plant on earth. Yet in 1923, the Canadian government, you know, outlaws the use of Indian hemp. You know, I mean, they had no right to do that. You know, hemp is a God-given plant. And it's also harmless, it's not addictive. No one has ever died in history from its use. So why in God's green earth would they outlaw it? Well, they would outlaw it to please their rich friends. And this is what they did. You know, back in the early 1900s, uh, John D. Rockefeller, he got together with some of his rich friends and they started all these medical foundations. And then the medical foundations, they took over the medical schools. Well, Mr. Rockefeller's friends, they're the guys that own the chemical companies. So, you know, what a great way to sell your products. Let's convince the public that, you know, this, these horrible substances are medicine, and that way we can dump it off to the public. And this is exactly what they did. The allopathic approach to medicine. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the totally wrong approach to medicine. You know, I mean, for uh, all through history, we used empiric medicine, medicine for plants. And that's what got us here. I hate it today when they, you know, they'll come out and they'll say, well, today, you know, uh, what we have is conventional medicine. Well, what's conventional about chemotherapy or radiation? You know, when, no, there was no such thing 100 years ago. But today, this is conventional medicine. I think it's more like conventional madness is the bottom line. Because, I mean, we all know that these treatments that they're giving us for cancer, they're carcinogenic. They cause cancer. So, I mean, if you had someone that had been shot with a gun, would you shoot them again to treat them? You know, <laughs> this is basically what you're doing. You're using a cancer-causing treatment to treat cancer. And basically, they have no batting average whatsoever. You know, it's just horrible. You know, like when, I mean, when you think about all the people you've known throughout your life that have come down with serious cancers, how many of them are still alive? Very few of them. Just the lucky ones. I always say that, you know, anybody that takes chemo or radiation, they didn't live because they took these treatments. They lived in spite of them. Their own immune systems kicked in and saved their lives. But, I mean, I wouldn't even consider taking chemo or radiation for anything. As a matter of fact, most, most of the substances that doctors give out, when they, you know, when they become doctors, they're supposed to follow what, what they call the Hippocratic Oath. Now, the Hippocratic Oath is the essence of medicine. It's what medicine is based on. You know, first do no harm. I shall not administer poisons. But when doctors become doctors, the first thing they do is break that oath. And they're giving us liver toxic chemicals. And this goes on and on and on. You know, it's, it's not the same medical system I grew up with. You know, years ago, if you got sick, I mean, back in the 50s, 1960s, you go to the doctor, he would give you a prescription, a month later, you, you'd be done, and you'd be well again. But today, in most cases, you go to the doctor, and he puts you on one medication. Then he puts you on another one. And it just continues on and on. And, you know, they're, they're literally killing people to death. But one of my greatest concerns today is really what they're doing to our children. You know, they try to tell us that cannabis cannot be used with children. You know, it can affect their learning abilities. <laughs> Well, I mean, Melanie Dreher, she did a study back in the 1980s, and she traveled around the world 
define where the healthiest babies on this planet were born. Now she found that the healthiest babies on earth are born to mothers who smoke or use hemp a great deal down in Jamaica. So if a baby is not harmed in the developmental stages when they're in the womb from the mother's use of cannabis, then why would it harm a child of any age? There's no harm factor involved with this medication. But yet, they'll, go, they'll give our children Ritalin and all these other horrible drugs. And they don't know what effect that's going to have on those children, you know, as time goes by. That, that's okay, you know, feed the children poison, but don't give them anything that could actually help them. I mean, if I had a child that had what they call attention deficit disorder, I would put the child on oil. I wouldn't even think about using Ritalin. And, you know, when we see these movies like Bowling for Columbine, you know, where the children went into the school and shot their classmates. Well, what they don't talk about is what were those children on? They were on drugs. You know, this is what caused all this, but they don't talk about this. So, you know, they, they, the rich have done basically everything they could, you know, to keep us enslaved. I mean, years ago, basically what they did, they went in and they took over the political parties. You know, with the corruption, and then the parties started doing their bidding. Well, as soon as that started, the public didn't have anybody to represent them. And it just got worse and worse, you know, until we're at the stage we are today. And, you know, in the world we're living in, it's becoming more and more toxic every day. You know, Fukushima, the Gulf oil spill, all these horrible things that go on every day. You know, these insults to Mother Earth. Well, none of us are designed to live in a toxic environment. <coughs> And sooner or later, I think that actually in the very near future, if we don't wise up and start treating this planet right, then I believe in the near future we will go extinct. Because we just can't survive, in, you know, in, with, this much, with this many toxins around us. We just can't do it. There might be some insects and whatnot that might survive it, but the human race will be no more. So, I mean, we do have a chance here that we can save this earth and we can save ourselves. We can end starvation because of this wonderful plant, its ability, you know, the seeds. You can feed the world with these seeds. You know, you see all of these horrible pictures of children starving to death in foreign nations in these harsh climates. Well, the only reason they're starving is because their governments won't let them grow cannabis. Because it, cannabis will grow in a harsh environment. And if they had the cannabis seeds, they would not starve. And the other thing, like, you know, energy. You know, today, with the new enzyme processes they have, one acre of cannabis can, can produce 1,800 gallons of ethanol. Now, 1,800 gallons, that's enough to run your car, heat your home, and have a few hundred gallons left over. That would make you energy independent. But the government doesn't want that, do they? Because their rich friends want to keep you buying their gasoline. This is what it's all about. It just, when you, when you look at cannabis, and you look at the reasons it was restricted, you know, the cotton industry, the chemical industry, the forestry industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the energy providers. Every one of these big industries stood against cannabis because it was a threat to their profits. So the governments go along with the big money, they outlaw cannabis, the most medicinal plant in the world, and what happens? Well, we get to die for 90 years in this country, 1923 to the present day. How many people have died and suffered needlessly because this medicine was made unavailable for them to take? And whose fault is that? I mean, in, I, in 2003, I went to the federal government. I went to all the different political parties about this. Now, right now in this country, we're losing about 70,000 Canadians or, or a bit more every year to cancer. Now multiply that by 10, because I've been doing this for over 10 years. That's over 700,000 Canadians that have died. And this is just one disease that this medicine works miracles for. Now, I'm not saying that we could have saved every one of them, but I can tell you one thing, we could have saved the vast majority. Now, whose fault is it that these people are no longer with us? Who can we blame? Would it be our government? Of course it would, it's their fault. Because they're responsible, they're, you know, they're responsible for our welfare. They are our government, and they should be doing what's right for us. But instead, they just keep running away from this issue, pretending that it isn't real. Well, I mean, look at the internet today. 
That's all you see is wall to wall. I mean, all of these testimonials from all these different people with these different conditions. Well, what are they all liars? No, I think they're telling the truth. But, you know, as long as the government can do it, they're, they're going to drag their feet on this because they want the pharmaceutical industry to run the show. And if the pharmaceutical industry gets their dirty fingers into cannabis again, well, it'll come, you know, if the government gets their way, it'll come with a lot of regulation and a lot of taxation. And, you know, aren't we all paying enough taxes already? Yeah. You know, I think so. <laughs> You know, I had to laugh in Europe because many of the countries I was in, they said, you know, you're so lucky. You know, you're from Canada. You know, they have free medicine there. And I just look at them and say, you know, if you knew the taxation that we're paying, you wouldn't think it was so free. You know, nothing comes for free these days. And when you look at all these big fancy hospitals and the, and the big salaries, well, that's coming out of our pockets. We're the ones paying for it. So medicine is hardly free. But, you know, I, I just don't get it today with the, you know, with the doctors. I, I can't understand how they can ignore their own Hippocratic Oath, you know, and do this kind of harm to their patients. Because if you walked up to any 10-year-old, and you said to a 10-year-old, is chemo and radiation good for you? Instantly, that 10-year-old would say no, because he knows it isn't good for him. But yet, 30 years later or 20 years later, that same 10-year-old becomes a doctor, and then he tells you, well, this is necessary for me to treat you effectively. It's more like, this is necessary for me to kill you effectively. Because this is what, this is the general you know, outcome of these things. So, you know, it, it's really just with us, it, it's a matter of trying to wake the public up to the situation we are truly in. You know, I, I mean, we are the power. The people have the power in any country. And if we want something done, if we stand up and we want something to happen, we can make it happen. You know, there's one, there's a million of us to every one of them. So if we want this, if we want this medicine legalized, we can make it so. And I can tell you right now, if I was the prime minister of this country, this medicine would be legal tomorrow morning. Everybody would have it. Well, today, you know, it's essential for, as far as I'm concerned, for every man, woman, and child on this planet to be taking small doses of this oil every day, just to maintain good health. Because, like I said, the toxins are all around us, and the oil detoxifies your body. It brings you, if you're overweight, it brings you back to a healthy weight, but it also detoxifies your body. And that's very, very important, you know, because those toxins, over time, they turn into diseases, and before you know it, you've got cancer or some other horrible condition. But, the, you know, the word uncurable, I've heard that so many times <laughs> through the medical. I mean, I worked in a hospital for 25 years myself. You know, and they have people with all these different conditions. Well, but that's incurable. That's incurable. Well, the, the word incurable doesn't mean much when you're working with high-quality oil. You know, I mean, I, I told people right along, if this oil does not heal you and cure you, you're going to find that it is the best control you will find for your condition. And I've seen that over and over again. <clears throat> and I, I've actually, I've challenged the, you know, the medical system. If you've got anything for any disease that works better than this, show it to me. They won't do it because they don't have it. You know, and they've been telling us, you know, from the time I was a child, we need preventative medicine. Well, here it is. But they don't want it because it's going to rain on their little parade. But like I said, you know, this world belongs to us and we have to take control of our own destiny because the people that we have put in charge, the authorities that we currently have, they're not going to do anything for us. I think they've proved that over and over again. I mean, I'm 63 years old now. I've seen, I can't remember how many elections. I've never, I've never seen a politician yet keep a promise. Have any of you? No. So why, isn't that the definition of insanity when you keep doing the same thing over again and over again and expecting a different result? <laughs> because this is what this is, it is insanity. They're, they're not going to help us. So it's left to us to help ourselves. You know, we're the ones, we have to get off our Chesterfields, 
where you, you know, get together with like-minded people, discuss this, bring more and more people, you know, into, into your groups, and very soon, we'll have enough people that we can overwhelm them. You know, when I tell people like this, you know, if someone is being charged, uh, like a medicinal user is being charged, don't just sit home and say, well, you know, that's too bad, I support them. Go to the courthouse, surround the courthouse, but let them know how your displeasure over what they're doing. I mean, no, no, no court has the right to take a medicine away from a patient, for God's sakes. You know, and right under, if you look at the laws, now as I understand it, laws are supposed to be based on the King James Bible. And under God's law, growing hemp is not a crime. And under common law, it's not, it's not a crime either. But if you, if you understand what laws, uh, what laws are about, they, it's written that no law shall supersede God's law. Well, all these courts that we have today, they're superseding God's laws because they're bringing us into these courts and they're charging us with crimes that in reality are not truly crimes at all. So, you know, I mean, justice or, or laws are supposed to be based on the harm factor. Now, if something is causing a great deal of harm, well, fine, put a law against it. That makes sense. But in 1923, when the Canadian government put the law in place against this plant, well, there must have been a terrible problem with cannabis. There must have been people smoking it and harming themselves. No, there wasn't. As a matter of fact, it was 14 years later, in 1937, before the first charge was ever made in Canada. So that tells you right there. There was no cannabis problem in 1923. It was all done, you know, with the use of corruption. And this is something I, I know a conversation I had one night with Jack Herrer. Uh, Jack called me and he was talking about the initiatives they had planned for California. And Jack had his own set of initiatives. And of course, about a half an hour into it, Jack said to me, he said, Rick, what do you think of the, you know, these initiatives? And I said, well, Jack, if it was me, I, I would just throw them in a trash can. And he said, well, what does that mean? I said, well, Jack, you know, both you and I know that any law, act, statute, whatever restriction they ever put in place against this plan, they, they put them in place with the use of corruption. Now, in a democratic society, are we supposed to follow corrupted laws? Not in my book. And then you got outfits like normal. You know, they've been running around for 40 years trying to get cannabis legalized. It's mostly, the normal is mostly made up of lawyers, of course that figures. <laughs> but after all these years, they still haven't got it legalized. So all of these legal eagles, in truth, they can't even get, it, they can't even get rid of a law that doesn't even exist. That's the situation. You know, there, there's so many people that actually stand against, you know, the free use of this medicine. Because if it was up to me, we should be growing cannabis the same as we do any other crop, a farm crop. You know, take, the, take 200 acre fields, one, one full of corn, one full of cannabis. What, what's a pound of corn worth? <coughs> Practically nothing. Now, if you had 100 acres of cannabis, what would, what, what would a pound of high grade medicinal bud be worth? Five bucks? You know, it's just these laws that are causing all this, well, what they call crime, because they, they made it, you know, they made it into an industry. And even the growers themselves actually stand against what I want to do, because, you know, they would actually have to start working for a living. You'd have to grow a few acres to make a living. So, it, you know, there, there's so many obstacles in the path of this, but it's the only thing that's right for the human race. You know, this is our future. And it's not just our futures, it's like, like our, our pets, the livestock. I mean, farmers for all through, all through the centuries, farmers always grew cannabis. They used to feed their livestock with the pressed uh, hemp seed cake. They're some of the best animal feed in the world. And that's part of the reason why if you look at animals like rabbits and deer, I mean, they just love this stuff. Because in many cases, I think animals are a bit smarter when it comes to, to knowing what's good for them. And they, they love cannabis. And uh, I mean, all animal life, yeah, all animals, they all have cannabinoid receptors. You know, like many times, like I, I treated a good number of dogs. Now often, I, I love working with animals because their metabolism is so much quicker than in humans. 
And usually within a week to a week and a half, we can cure a dog with terminal cancer. And, uh, you know, I mean, the oil knocks them down, but it doesn't hurt them. And the dogs, the, the, the dog, really, they're so sensitive. I, I tried it one time with a, a dog that I had home. You know, she was a, what, 130 pound lab German Shepherd cross. Big, beautiful dog, very, very friendly. But, you know, she was about 19 years old. So she was really getting wore down and tired. So my son said to me, he said, you know, as soon as he's getting, you know, pretty tired looking, I said, okay, I said, let's give her a dose of oil, or two doses of oil for five days, and let's see what happens. So anyway, I gave her the first dose, and it was probably around a quarter or a third of a gram, a good big dose. And so all of a sudden, down goes the dog. About 20 minutes later, she's laying there on the floor, you know, <laughs> all happy. And, uh, <clears throat> well, that evening, I mean, after the effects wore off, that evening, I, I thought that she wouldn't take any more. I thought it would scare her. But as soon as I put it on my finger, over she come, take her right off the finger, down she go again. So I did this for five days, twice a day. And on the fifth day, when I was done giving her the last treatment, that dog was running no, it was over 100 yards to the road where I live. It's over 100 yards to the highway. That dog was running in and out that driveway just like it was a one-year-old pup. I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And then one day, just for the hell of it, I took it, I had some, like I make a lot of oil, I used to make a lot of oil for skin conditions. You know, make oil from the, the leaves and shake. And you can use that quite effectively for many skin conditions. So I had a little bit of this oil. So I took a little bit of it, put it on my finger, and I called Susie over. And she came over and she put her nose down to it. But I swear to God, she gave me a dirty look. She looked, looked at me and walked away. So I went over and I got some of the high grade oil. As soon as I put the hydrate on, off the finger, just like that. So animals are very intelligent when it comes, you know, when it comes to these medicines. And it, and it works, like I said, it works miracles for them. Now, when I started doing this back in 2003, I mean, I, like I said, I went to all the right people, you know, but nobody would do a thing. So then I took my case to the public. I started, you know, passing the oil to different people I knew with skin conditions. And then about a year later, I started supplying it for internal conditions like cancer and chronic pain or MS, you know, what have you. But to sit and witness what I did, because I mean, I didn't have any medical background. You know, I worked at a hospital for 25 years, but I was an engineer. I wasn't a doctor. And to see these people coming to me with all of these different medical problems, and I'd give them the oil, and a week, two weeks later, and guess what? It worked. You know, and this just continued on and on. And then when I started uh, in 2004 supplying it, you know, to terminal cancer patients for internal use, well, I, I already knew because I'd already cured my own cancer in 2003, but I had skin cancer. So I, I just kind of figured, well, to cure skin cancer on the outside, what would it do on the inside? You know, and I was ingesting the oil anyway because of my medical condition. You know, I had post-concussion syndrome. So I was ingesting the oil anyway. And I, knew it would, and I knew it wouldn't harm anyone. So I started passing that oil out there. It was just like one cancer patient after another. You know, and then it took time, but I developed a protocol, you know, of how people should take the oil. And that's all available up on our website. You know, all the instructions are there, how to produce it, what's, what's type of, uh, what type of cannabis you should be looking for, the dosage instructions, it's all there. And the beauty of it is any of us can do it. You know, anybody can grow cannabis, and the, the oil is so simple that in, in reality, if, if, I, if I had the material right here, I could put on a blindfold in front of all you people, and I could make it blindfolded. It's not hard at all. It's, I, I say it ranks right up there with making a cup of coffee. So it's not all that difficult. But, you know, the simple method that we showed with the coffee, uh, with, the, with the rice cooker, Although it's kind of embarrassing, I, I mean, I, I didn't want to show people that method, but I needed a simple way to show everyone how they could heal themselves and how they could make their own medicine. Now, for years, I used a big stainless steel still that I had built myself, and then I used to reclaim the solvents. But then in 2005, the RCMP took that away from me. So then I was kind of desperate because I had many patients coming to me. So I went to Canadian Tire and I looked at the rice cookers. 
Well, sure enough, when I tried it at home, it worked perfectly because it has the two heat settings. The high heat setting boils it off, but as it boils down in the rice cooker, then once the temperature starts to climb, it auto the rice cooker automatically goes to low heat. And that's exactly what you want because if you get up over 300 degrees Fahrenheit, then all the cannabinoids start vaporizing off the oil. And if you, if you allow it to stay on the heat for too long, it will, it will completely ruin the oil. So the rice cookers worked out very well. And well, thanks to those rice cookers, hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions now worldwide, you know, have used that method and they've been able to heal themselves or, or their loved ones. And it, you know, it's very, very empowering. You know, literally, when, when you know about this medicine, you then have your own medical system. You know, in most cases, if you had a big jar of this oil, you wouldn't need to go to a doctor. You could just use the oil. And, uh, you know, there's so many situations because, like, the, the oil itself, it rejuvenates vital organs. So many of these organ transplants that people have to endure today, they could, most of the organ transplants could be eliminated. Most of the cancer could be eliminated. You know, and, and so many of these other diseases like diabetes. You know, we've had wonderful results with diabetes too. Well, you know, is it better to go through life, you know, punching your skin full of needle holes, you know, to take insulin? Or is it better just to take some oil and feel a whole lot better? And it, you know, it's not just about lowering your blood sugar. The oil is also good for circulation. It works in all respects. And this is what I say, you know, it, it, it actually promotes full body healing. And this is what I, when I look, you know, at any, and pe people today, I mean, by the time you hit 30 or 40 years old today, your bodies are all full of toxins. You just can't avoid it. But so, you know, it's just as if you all had cancer. The best thing you could do for your bodies would be to actually go out, get a 60 gram treatment, take it over a three month period, bring your body right back to a state of perfect health, and then drop it back to a maintenance dose. One to two drops at night, just before you go to bed, to maintain good health. And that's all you have to do. You know, but I mean, a lot of people say, you know, well, I'm not sick right now. Well, that's fine, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, but the day's gonna come when you are gonna get sick, but if you take the oil now, you can, you can avoid it. This is what I mean, preventative medicine. And this is the way to go, I think. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the only thing I know that can protect us, like from the, from the damage, when you look at Fukushima, you know, and this oil can protect you from radiation damage. I, I've had many people come to me that had gone through radiation, and they're burnt, you know, right from their chest, right through to their backs. Their, their chest looks like it's made from red leather. It's burnt that badly. It even feels like leather. Three months later, the patient comes back, they take off their shirt, You'd never know they had never know they had radiation. All that radiation damage is gone. So this can do the same thing for us. It can protect us because with these particles that are flying around today, I mean, you can't even see them. A little speck of that lands on your food. Well, instantly, you eat that food, you've got cancer. You know, so we definitely need protection. But it's not just the cancer. I mean, it's the rate of all diseases today. You know, look at the number of people that have Crohn's now. Now, Crohn's was almost unheard of. Now, then we've got that brand new one, Alzheimer's, also very effective for Alzheimer's. We're even treating people with schizophrenia with this oil, with wonderful results. You know, I know that's another thing the doctors have told us forever, you know, keep it away from children, anybody that uh, leans towards schizophrenia, keep them away from, you know, cannabis. Well, back, uh, let's see, it was 19, uh, what, 1990, I knew a young man who was going to teacher's college. And uh, by the time he graduated, he was, he was acting very strange. And then within a month, month and a half, he was diagnosed as a full-blown schizophrenic. So about two years later, he came down to my house one day, and he was talking about all this crazy stuff, you know, about gods and missiles, and because I mean, they're, they're really not right in the head when they got schizophrenia. But he pulls a joint out of his pocket, he lights it up, smokes about half it, and all of a sudden he started talking normal. He started talking about motorcycle trips and things that we had done together. And he, it was just like all of a sudden he was back. So as soon as I was done talking to him, I called his mother and I told her what I had witnessed. I said, you know, 
I, I think the cannabis actually did this. And then, of course, she said, no, no, the doctors say stay away from, you know, cannabis and all that. So there was no arguing with her. <clears throat> but a, a few years later, I, I, when, I, when I started making the oil, a, a lot of the local growers used to come to me because they liked the way I made the oil. So this grower came this day, and I made a bunch of oil for him. And it was about three months later, I was in the parking lot in Amherst, and he walks up to me. And he said, Ricky said that oil really works. And I kind of looked at him, and I, I said, well, you didn't tell me that there was anything wrong with you when, you when you were at the house. I said, what medical condition did you have? And he said, I'm bipolar, borderline schizophrenic. As soon as he said it, I just looked at him. I said, what did you do? He said, I went home. I got the oil. I went home. I took all those pills. I threw them in the garbage. And he said, I went on the oil. He said, I'm now back to work, and I'm feeling great. You see, the, the pineal gland controls our perception of reality. And when you take the oil, the pineal gland gets decalcified from the effects of the oil. And the pineal gland also actually produces the melatonin our bodies require. Now, melatonin is the greatest antioxidant on Earth, and it travels to every cell in our bodies. Now, when you're young or you're, you have young children, you, you've, you've all seen ch uh, how a child can sleep 10, 12 hours. You know, they just go to bed and it's just like they die. Well, the reason is, is because a child is full of melatonin. But what happens as you age, by the time you get about 40, your body's hardly producing any melatonin at all. And then what happens is you get insomnia. You start having sleeping problems. And uh, I mean, I, I know that because I went through it myself. You know, back before I got hurt, I was only sleeping about four hours a night. And I was getting out of bed the next morning more tired than when I went to bed. But as soon as I got on that oil, it was like, oh my God. You know, I, I started bouncing out of bed. You know, well rested. I felt good. You know, and it cured the arthritis in my knees. It, it did so many things for me. It, it's, it's almost embarrassing because, I mean, when I first made the oil, it was about 1999. So I made the oil, but then I was afraid to take it. It sat there for two years. You know, I was still taking the pharmaceuticals, hoping to God it was going to help, and of course it didn't. But, I mean, I knew that smoking cannabis would help me some, and it was giving me more rest than any of the pharmaceuticals the doctors provided. But, you know, I've just taken a pound of cannabis and I've reduced it down to a concentrate. And with no medical background or nothing to go by, I mean, I was literally terrified to take this stuff. <laughs> So 2001, the medical system cut me loose anyway. They said, nothing more we can do for you. You're on your own. And of course, I asked for a prescription again, but they wouldn't give it to me. So I went home, and I started taking the oil. Well, it, I, I started with uh, about fairly small doses, but within a, within a month, I was up taking about a third of a gram before I went to bed at night. And I was feeling much better. My thinking processes were clearing. It was helping me in so many different ways. But this one night, I got thinking, I said, well, what would happen if I took more? So, I went out and I took a, a, a well over a half a gram, probably closer to three quarters of a gram of this oil. And I put it on my finger, popped it in my mouth, scraped it off my teeth, took a cold drink of water, and down it went. <clears throat> so about 45 minutes later, I'm getting this really tired feeling. So I get out and I get, in, in, I get out of the bedroom and I get in bed. And I'm laying there, and about 10 minutes later, I started getting like a squamish feeling, almost like, like I was going to become sick. So I said to myself, I said, well, you better get up and go to the bathroom. But when I went to move, I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. I mean, I, I was laying there in bed, and I consciously said, lift your finger. I couldn't even lift my finger. You know, and I was laying there thinking, you know, like, what did I do to myself? You know, because I didn't have the knowledge of what this medicine was about. So, but luckily for me, within about 45 seconds, the old temper come up, and I said to myself, you know, get out of this bed, you fool. Go to the bathroom. Well, as soon as I did that, I could move again. It's just that the oil is so deeply relaxing, it, it actually can almost make you feel that you're paralyzed. But, I mean, it wears off the next day I get up. I was still a little bit woozy the next morning when I got up, but within an hour, I was back to normal. So, there, like I said, even overdosing, it's not like... It's not like the medicines that doctors give us. 
I mean, if you had a, a big jar of oil and a big jar of aspirin sitting in, in your home, <clears throat> now if you took a spoon and if you could eat that whole jar of oil, now you might sleep for a month or more, but you're not going to be harmed. When you wake up, you're unharmed. Now take that same spoon. See how, many, see how many spoonfuls of aspirin you can eat before you end up in a graveyard. Now, the oil is perfectly safe. But every year, thousands of people worldwide die from even simple drugs like aspirin. So, I mean, when you, when you look at all the aspects of what a, what a medicine should be, cannabis has it all. You know, as a matter of fact, I, I tell people, I said, look, I don't look at cannabis at all as being a drug. I look at it as being a medicine. It's a medicine you can use to heat you to heal yourself, or is it's a medicine that you can use recreationally with good effect. Because it's been, it's already been proven that people who smoke cannabis on average live about six years longer than those who don't. Now that's just the smoking aspect. Now I'm, I don't push the smoking aspect because you know although it is it is a form of preventative medicine, it is still it doesn't it does not measure up to what the oil can do. You know, when you light a joint on fire, over 90% of the medicinal aspect just went up in smoke. But when you take the raw, unburned cannabinoids right into your body, you know, orally or by suppository or, or using a vaporizer, that type of thing, those cannabinoids are entering your body unburned, and that's when you see the magic happen. Because it works with your endocannabinoid system, and it produces all, one, all kinds of wonderful effects. You know, but for most of us, you know, by the time we hit 50, we really don't have much to look forward to. You know, diabetes, arthritis, cancer, suffer, suffer, suffer. You know, uh, if you live to be 90, well, the last 40 years of your life, you're going to wish you weren't alive anyway. Well, that's the way it is. Now, I mean, sooner or later, we're all going to pass on. And we all know that. But what we're most afraid of is all that suffering before we die. You know, would you like to have chronic pain for 20 years before you finally pass away? You know, I think actually, after having chronic pain for 20 years, passing away would be a relief. But the beauty with this oil, we can, we can eliminate that suffering. And when you get on the oil, you feel like living again. And I mean, I've had so many people, I remember one couple in particular, uh, there were a couple that were in their late 50s, both suffering with arthritis. And... They came to my home and I told them about the oil and I provided it for them. And a month later, the, the, the husband and his wife, they came back to my home. And when he came into my kitchen, the, the husband, he walked right over and he shook my hand and he said, Rick, he said, I want to thank you for giving us our lives back. He said, because, you know, we were in pain every day. We weren't enjoying life. You know, now we feel like living again. And I think, you know, that's what we all deserve, don't we? You know, life is supposed to be about living. It's not supposed to be about suffering. So if we can eliminate the suffering, I think we better do it. And we better do it quick. But I, I, I believe in the... Always got to have my Pepsi. Oh, I mean, we're all addicted to something. No, uh, you know, if, 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 you know, if the authorities had only listened to people the way they should have, you know, I mean, back in the early 70s, they, they formed the Schaefer Commission down in the states. Now, the Schaefer Commission came right back and they told Richard Nixon legalize that plant, completely legalize it. And then the Schaefer Commission also told Nixon that they that it was their opinion that this plant should not be deemed to be a narcotic. And they also said that they felt that, that it belonged in a category by itself. And I would agree with that. I think the most medicinal plant on earth should belong in a category by itself. But what did Tricky Dicky do? Well, he turned right around and started the war on drugs. And most of that war was directed towards the eradication of the, of the cannabis hemp plant. Now, I guess none of that should surprise any of us because we all know how honest a man Mr. Nixon was after he was impeached. As a matter of fact, I think they should just impeach them all because they're all a bunch of crooks. Now, I mean, the inside of politics is, is, is pretty ugly. I mean, I ran two federal elections on this issue. 
And the newspapers, they called me the one issue candidate. You know, one issue. What? Uh, feed, the, feed the world, provide all the energy, the medicine. Uh, you can make 50,000 different things from cannabis hemp that we use in our day-to-day -day lives, but the newspapers said it was just one issue. You know, they, they do everything they can to discredit you. And a lot of the venues that the other people that represented parties were invited to, I wasn't even invited. You know, if you're, if you're the independent, you get shoved out the back door. But this is what I tell people, like, you know, and what we need right now, we need people to stop voting for the parties. Yeah. Because the parties are not doing us any damn good. We need independent people from every area representing us. No more of these four-year terms where, you know, I don't care what I did wrong, you can't get rid of me for four years. You know, if we do something wrong in our jobs, how long is it before they show us the door? Within seconds. You know, there's the door, get, don't come back. It should be the same for politicians. Because, I mean, you're representing the public, and if you're not doing that job properly, again, it should be there's the door. You know, no more of this four-year term going to protect you. And no more of this towing the party line because we already know the parties are completely corrupted. And I really do think that if we took Ottawa, we should take it and turn Ottawa into a museum. And we take about 18 or 20 people, say two of the best in medicine, two of the best in fishery, two of the best in forestry, you know, two of the best in farming, and put these people on a think tank. I'll say have them sit on a think tank with an open book policy to the people. Nothing hidden, no more backdoor meetings, not, no nonsense. You know, you're representing the people. Let them make the day-to-day -day decisions that would run our country. And guess what? I think we would have a whole lot better country than we have today, don't you? Yeah. It really, I mean, it is, it's, it's all our faults that the world is the way it is because we, we've, we've allowed it to become that way. I mean, for years I walked around hating the doctors, I hated the politicians, I hated them all because they wouldn't respond. But the simple truth is, if most of us were in any of these positions ourselves, how much differently would we behave? You know, it, it's, it's, it's just that we don't seem to, you know, we, think, we always wait and we think somebody else is going to fix it for us. Well, this time, that's not going to happen. It's like I said, if, if this is going to be fixed, we're the ones that have to do it, and we've got to do it right away. I mean, in 2003, when I seen what this medicine can do, I knew the situation I was in, and I thought about it, because every second patient that came to me, they were all sitting there at my table, and they look at me, and they say, you know, they're going to come kill you. <laughs> and that makes you feel real good, you know. You're, you're trying to help a patient by giving them the oil, and then they're telling you that the system's going to come kill you for doing it. So it, it, it's, it, you know, there's a lot of different things going through my mind. But... You know, I, I have three grandchildren, and I wanted to see a future for them. And I realized that this medicine is not available. What future do they have? And I, at the time, I, I didn't even think that I was doing anything that special. I just figured, well, they've been making oil from this plant for decades. So I figured other people on the planet had to be doing the same. But a few months later, when I found out that basically I was the only one doing this, well, it's a little bit of a scary spot, <laughs> but I was already in it too deep, and there's no going back. You know, you, you're left between what's right and what's wrong, and there's no damn gray area. You know, I did the right thing. I have no regrets. It's cost me my country. It's cost me my life. It cost me everything I ever had, but if I had to go back and do it all again tomorrow, I would do the same thing because it was the right thing to do. Now all we got to do is get our governments thinking along the same lines. <laughs> if they could just do the right thing for a change. But, you know, I, I hope that this time, you know, it's time really that the whole human race grew up. You know, we've gone through all of these crazy wars and all this bloodshed. You know, for what? We, we already know wars don't get us anywhere. Killing each other doesn't get us anywhere. I honestly think it's just time for us to unite and then try to begin to understand each other. You know, learn to live together in peace and harmony and start caring about, you know, start caring about your neighbors and even people in other countries. 
Because that old saying about, you know, if something is harming someone somewhere, sooner or later, that same harm is going to come to your door. And that's, that's a fact. So if we would, you know, we become so self-centered in our lives that we, we all seem to think that the world revolves around us. Well, it doesn't. You know, we, we, you know, we need to work together. I'm really a, a spiritual person. I, I don't, I'm not big on religion at all. But I, I think that we are all connected spiritually. And if we could just come together and, and make this world a better place, I think in no time, you know, we, we, could, we could start a, a new day for mankind, a completely new day. You know, no more, you know, ease the suffering of the people. You know, live in harmony, live in peace, and understand each other. And maybe, I, I would even say, I think it's really time for a world government. But not the New World Order variety. I'm totally against the New World Order. But if we had like a World Council and we took the resources that these rich and powerful people have stolen from us, because that's what it is, it's the proceeds of crime. When you look at Rockefellers, Rothschilds, all those people, all, of that, all those resources and all that money that they have, they stole it from all of us, is what they did. They used lies and deception to, to rob us. Now, if we, well, if we robbed a bank, would they let us keep the money? Don't think so, because it's the proceeds of crime. So this is what I say we should do. We should take these rich types in into a real common law court, make them admit their guilt, and then, I mean, I'm not saying to lock them up, although they are criminals, there's no question, but they're very sick-minded. You know, these are not healthy people. But I would say just send them home, let them live out the rest of their lives with a whole lot less than they had before, and put those resources and that funding in the hands of this World Council, and let them disperse the funding and resources worldwide to help everyone in every nation. Now, this is what we should be doing. You know, why should people in one nation be starving to death while people in another nation have too much to eat? You know, we've got to balance it out. But if we had a good, if we had a world council and, like I said, open book policy to the public, I think we could do it in a very short time. And then we could get rid of the, all these politicians that want to start such things as gun control. Remember now in Rock started that one? You know, uh, you know, we have to protect the Canadian people. Uh, we will have to put gun control in place. Well, I mean, I, I grew up with a loaded gun right at the damn corner. I mean, my father was a war veteran. I went over one day to empty the gun. My father looked at me and he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm just gonna empty the gun, Dad. He said, what good is an empty gun? Can't argue with that one. You know, but I mean, they made it today that you can't even protect your own home. You know, you don't have the right. And if, and if you were to use a weapon on somebody that broke into your house, well, guess who's going to jail? It's probably gonna be you. So to me, it, you know, the, the only reason that they're doing this gun control thing it's not because it's a danger to us. And what they're afraid of, they're afraid that we're gonna wake up and then we'll turn the guns on them. That's what they're afraid of. Now, I mean, I just look at a gun for what it is. It is a tool. And I mean, like, we, we didn't shoot each other. We didn't shoot anybody else. We knew the gun was there. We knew it was loaded. But we knew enough to not play with it. But yet here today, what, 50 years later, or 40 years later, you know, we gotta have gun control. We gotta have all this to protect us. You know, the, the world that I grew up in, I mean, my God, you didn't even take the keys out of your car. You left them in your car. Nobody took your damn car. Same thing with your, your home. You didn't have to lock your house back in the 50s and 60s. Today, the minute we leave, well, if we don't have everything locked down, we come back, everything's stolen. Why is that? Could it be all this drug abuse? All these people taking the pharmaceuticals, made doing home invasions. Well, here's another use we could have for this oil. In no time, we could break all of these people of all of these horrible addictions. Because I'm, I'm like, all the time, you know, when I was treating people, I was taking patients off of the opiates, the hydromorphine, usually within a week to a week and a half, with very little withdrawal. They're back, they're off the opiates, they're, off, they're not addicted anymore. Why don't we just take all these people make the oil available, break their addictions, and maybe we can make them useful human beings again. Because today, all I see today on the streets is, you know, young and old alike, 
It's just people walking around full of pills. And it just seems to me like half of them don't even know where they're at. And you can see how, you know, like, especially with the younger people, you know, how unhealthy these horrible drugs are making them. So I'm all in favor of good health, and I know cannabis can give it to us. So if we can break these addictions and get, the, get these drugs off the street, I think we should be doing so as quickly as possible. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I guess we're going to take about a five-minute break, and then we're going to come back with questions and answers. Uh, those, this period usually is the best because we have fun with it. And uh, so I'll be right back with you, with you folks in about about five minutes. Thank you.